great. Can everyone hear me? Uh, wonderful. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mayura Nagaz, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, which is better known as ISPU. I want to welcome you all here today. Um, thank you for joining in person despite the uh, challenges of traffic today, <laughs> which I know some of you may have come up against. I also want to thank all those people joining on the live stream um, from across the country. We're really grateful for all of you being here. We're joined today, whether online or in person, by educators and parents, school administrators, and others who work so hard to ensure that children grow up happy and healthy and that their school environment is conducive to doing so. So I also want to give a huge thanks to our host, the Bradamus Center at New York University, and to our partners um, who you'll be hearing from today. For those of you who uh, don't know about ISPU, we uh, are a research and education organization, a nonprofit, and we really envision a vibrant and truly pluralistic America where Muslims are both strong and equal participants. And we believe that relevant and rigorous research in the right hands will help us get there. So to this end, we conduct original research on American Muslim communities and the issues that impact upon them. And with that research, we use it to educate the general public and to enable a whole host of change makers, whether they be policymakers or journalists or educators or advocates, to really do their job smarter and more effectively. And in doing so, we ultimately aim to build understanding, to catalyze and support American Muslim community development, and to safeguard our American pluralism. Today's topic, sadly, could not be more timely. Just earlier this month, I was in my uh, backyard, my home backyard of Massachusetts, and a fifth grader in the town uh, next to where I grew up re had received death threats earlier this month in her cubby hole, two days in a row. And like many of you in this room, the good people who run the school where it happened are seeking answers. How do you create safe and inclusive schools? How do you address incidents of bullying when they occur? And how do you engage parents, young people, and community members in addressing this very serious issue? And how do you prepare teachers? We very much hope that our discussion today and our work on religious-based bullying helps answer some of these questions. Today is kind of a long time coming. Um, in early 2017, our annual American Muslim Survey illustrated the size and scope of the religious-based bullying problem. We found through that survey that at least 42% of Muslim parents that were surveyed had at least one child who was being bullied in the past year because of their religion. The Jewish community also suffered from religious-based bullying disproportionately. And anecdotally, while we don't have data, we know that Sikhs and Hindus are also targeted because of their religion. This data was widely published in media outlets throughout the aftermath of a divisive election cycle, and this inspired action across the country. One such, one such action was through the American Muslim Health Professionals, who, along with their interfaith partners, organized the first ever interfaith anti-bullying summit late last year, and we were very honored to be their research partner. This two-day summit brought together educators and administrators, guidance counselors, and mental health professionals to share best practices, research, and lessons learned, and discuss challenges and future directions. We captured these discussions and built upon them. And earlier this year, to coincide with National Bullying Prevention Month, we released our report that captures these discussions. And we very much hope that through sharing what we know about religious-based bullying, we can collectively move towards more safe and inclusive schools for everyone. We have an amazing panel here today. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce the people who will be speaking and sharing their findings, their expertise, and their wisdom, and their experiences. Um, we have full bios, which were printed, and I think some of you took them um, up at the front, so I'm not going to go through everyone's long bio, but just in a nutshell, our first speaker will be Dr. Nadia Ansari. She's an ISPU scholar, the author of the report that I showed you, and she's an associate professor of psychology at Ryder University. 
With her expertise on the topic of bullying, she was also appointed to the New Jersey Commission on Bullying in Schools. After Dr. Nadia Ansari, we'll hear from Dr. Roxana Chowdhury. She serves as the Director of Mental Health Programming for the American Muslim Health Professionals, through which she spearheaded the first ever National Interfaith Anti-Bullying Summit that I mentioned before. She also co-directs trauma programming at the Psychiatric Institute of Washington and is an assistant professor of clinical psychology at George Washington University. After Dr. Roxana, we'll hear from Suzanne Greenfield, who's the first director of DC's citywide bullying prevention program in the Office of Human Rights. She's a longtime school and social justice advocate. Then we'll hear from Vikram Singh Mengat. He's a natural born entrepreneur, finishing his bachelor's degree in management studies, and he currently co-owns a company with his mother, Dr. Kaur. Vikram has experienced bullying throughout a large portion of his life, and he has the courage to share his experiences with us today. And his mother, Dr. Harminder Kaur, is a medical doctor and an activist, as well as the co-founder of Sick Kid to Kid. She also chairs the education subcommittee of the Faith Community Working Group in Montgomery County. So I want to give a warm welcome to our first speaker, Dr. Nadia Ansari. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mira. Um, it's a privilege to speak to you this afternoon about uh, religious-based bullying. Um, I don't uh, need to go through all of the wonderful things that ISPU does. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of that, and Mira has provided an overview of the truly critical work that ISPU does to provide support to the Muslim American community. Um, in terms of my background, uh, as Mira said, uh, my area of interest is uh, of bullying of minorities, particularly religious minorities. I'm also interested in the bullying of Muslim youth in particular and what are the impacts of that bullying on psychological well-being. Unfortunately, religious-based bullying has received little research attention. Is it not showing? It's actually showing. Um, Which is different than what I have right. here. We don't have that on here. It, we can't <laughs> view the view of that chart. Maybe you do this thing. So what you see is not what we see. <laughs> It is. This is oh, there it is. Yeah. So if you go back. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. No problem mm -hmm. there. <laughs> okay. Now we're reset. We can begin. <laughs> um, so uh, religious-based bullying has received little research attention and even less in terms of programming. Um, and recognizing this urgent need the first ever National Interfaith Bullying Summit took place in December of last year. It was organized by the American Muslim Health Professionals, the Institute for Social Policy on, and Understanding, as well as other organizations such as ING, Sick Kid to Kid, and others. The objective of the summit and the report um, is to synthesize our most current understanding of religious-based bullying. The report recommendations were informed by the presenters um, from the summit, and all of these individuals are forerunners in research and programming um, regarding religious-based bullying. Thus, what you hear in the panel presentation today represents the most current evidence-based recommendations on the issue. And of course, the overall goal of this report and all the events that have been organized surrounding the dissemination of the report is to ensure that every child is educated in an environment 
that is free from abuse and within a school context in which every child is valued equally. So in the interest of time, I want to cover just some very key recommendations, and I hope that you will uh, uh, access the report for more detailed information about implementation um, and suggestions. So for today, um, I'll briefly discuss an overview of the issue and recommendations for educators and parents. So in terms of bullying, the scholarly literature defines bullying as requiring three criteria, an intent to harm, either physical or otherwise, an imbalance of power such that the target has difficulty defending him or herself, and the hurtful behavior is repeated or occurs in a persistent manner, meaning that there is a pattern or relationship that, um, that ensues between the target and the child who bullies. According to the U.S. Department of Education, in 2015, 1% of 12 through 18 year olds reported being the target of religious-based hateful speech while on school grounds. And I'd like to urge you to, um, to consider that this number vastly underrepresents the issue. Muslims, Jews, and Sikhs experience disproportionately higher levels of religious-based bullying. Now, collating across couple, a couple of studies, um, essentially uh, the rates span between roughly 30 to 50 percent for each of the groups. And again, these values are significantly higher than national norms, and uh, those national norms approximate about 20 percent. Of course, also, youth who wear visible symbols of their faith report higher levels of being targeted. Now, religious-based bullying can have serious uh, consequences for identity development, anxiety, and depression, as well as school engagement, um, especially since the attacks are seen to be or perceived to be as a direct result or uh, related to um, aspects or characteristics of the child. The child may believe that future attacks will ensue because they're directly related to um, identity characteristics. Um, it's also important to consider that some adults at school or teachers may perpetrate the bullying. Um, according to the 2017 ISPU report, in 25% of the bullying cases involving Muslim students, a teacher or administrator at the school perpetrated the bullying. Now, in terms of recommendations, um, I have some recommendations for uh, educators and parents. Um, for schools, it's critical that a sustained and systemic whole school approach to bullying prevention is implemented. Um, this means that there is a true investment at all levels of the school community to address bullying. A positive school climate is also essential, meaning that um, people feel safe and a sense of belonging to the school, um, and that this is also an important facet in bullying prevention. Teacher and staff training, of course, is important. Um, Social emotional character development is a critical feature of bullying prevention work. Um, and this is not just with regards to curriculum uh, development with regards to students, but it also involves modeling of behavior by adults in school. So the social emotional character development piece is not only essential for students, but they are also essential for all adults in the school. Promoting upstanders. So we want to move beyond bystanders simply witnessing uh, bullying incidents and remove that power dynamic that happens when there's a crowd of people um, that can um, sustain or promote these type of bullying incidences. In terms of the school's anti-bullying policy, um, there should be explicit mention of protected groups in the school's HIV or harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy. With regards to religious minorities, as well as um, more uh, minorities more broadly, cultural sensitivity and support for all minority students is critical. Um, and this involves religious literacy for teachers, um, addressing bias and inaccuracies in the curriculum with regards to um, uh, religious education. And um, it also involves support for individuals with disabilities. Right. So in terms of cultural sensitivity, we want to ensure that minority students feel a sense of belonging and a sense of being valued by their community and a sense of support as well. With regards to parents in cyberspace, there are also some critical uh, recommendations that we could make. Um, 
for parents, it's important to nurture communication with children so that we have um, an opportunity for children who experience uh, bullying to feel connected to their parents and to feel uh, comfortable in reporting those incidents uh, to parents. So it's important to develop a strong parent-child bond that's characterized by an honest dialogue. Um, we, we know from the literature that um, in two-thirds of the cases, kids don't report, um, particularly to adults. So um, it's important for children to feel comfortable to um, approach their parents with um, you know, um, uh, a situation of abuse. Um, parents, for parents, it's important that they monitor um, children's technology use. And um, this is particularly important with regards to cyberbullying. Um, I'd love to have more time to talk about cyberbullying because it um, presents a unique uh, sort of storm of factors that can promote bullying. Um, but for parents, um, one of the important things to, um, to do is to monitor children's technology use. Now, in terms of nurturing other relationships, parents should uh, work on nurturing relationships with teachers. Um, and this is particularly critical because they spend so much time, particularly with elementary school uh, kids, teachers really spend so much of the day with, uh, with their children there, with their students. Um, parents should also get acquainted with the anti-bullying policy of the school. Schools are uh, required to have that anti-bullying policy posted on their website. Um, and so in instances of bullying, it's important for parents to um, be equipped with that knowledge about what the school's responsibilities are when an incident of bullying is reported. Um, also, it's very important to look at the cyberbullying policy. Schools um, are different in terms of uh, to what degree they um, um, take some responsibility in intervening when cyberbullying happens. Um, and again, it, it, for me, uh, as, as an expert in bullying, I think it's very important that just because cyberbullying may not be happening on the school property, um, it's important that schools address it because it will spill over into the school day um, if it hasn't already originated from the school day. So it's very important for schools to address cyberbullying. I also want to encourage uh, parents to be active in the community organizations that um, are relevant to them. And so in the, um, the summit, we heard over and over again the relevance and salience of community-based organizations in trying to uh, support minority individuals and for affecting change. For parents, um, oftentimes the question that we get um, in panel presentations, um, et cetera, is what happens when bullying happens? What should I do as a parent? Um, so when bullying happens, it's important to communicate and document. So um, when parents um, have meetings at schools, for example, with administrators or teachers with regards to a bullying incident, it's important to document the contents of that meeting with the school staff um, so that there is a record that will enhance accountability. So in closing, um, I wanted to just very briefly tap the major elements of the report um, in terms of rec recommendations, rather, for parents and educators. I hope that you will read the report because it really has a wealth of information um, that can support parents and educators. I also hope that you'll visit ISPU's website which provides more resources including a toolkit for educators for how to address the problem. So as noted earlier, the report recommendations were informed by the presenters at the summit who are forerunners in research and programming regarding religious-based bullying. So this represents our most current understanding of evidence-based strategies to address the problem. So it is our hope that the report and the events surrounding the dissemination of the report, such as today's panel presentation, will help promote educational environments where religious minority youth feel safe, feel that they're a valued part of a community of learners, and that they are invested in a school that recognizes the rights of each child equally. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention.
Thank you, Dr. Ansari, for that uh, great presentation on the white paper. I am Dr. Roxana Chaudhry, and um, a little bit about my background is I'm a clinical psychologist, and I teach at the George Washington University. And as Mira said, uh, I direct mental health programming for the American Muslim Health Professionals. And we, together with our partners, Sick Kid to Kid, um, and ING put together the summit. So, you know, I'm going to go over a little bit more about the recommendations, but I'm just, I'm really proud to be here today. It was, um, you know, a year long effort to put together this summit and for it to come to fruition in, in this amazing white paper that I think will really have an impact is just, it's a, it's a, it's a great moment for everyone, I think, involved. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the recommendations that go on to community members and organizations and practitioners and then go on to a presentation about the general impact of bullying and its connection to mental health, and hopefully that will set us up for our next speakers. So uh, Nadia did talk about the issue of uh, how to respond as students and how that works in the school, and one of the, the you know, words that come up a lot is this idea of being an upstander, and something we found from the summit is that you know, this can be a really broad term, but when we looked at examples through the summit, we found this really meant in, in specific programming that had to do with how to teach uh, kids to sort of be mentors to other kids, whether it was through, through peer mentorship or by um, understanding mental health as a young person and the impact of bullying. So a lot of the examples were really great that we had seen by people who had come to the summit. Um, in fact, there was one, one that had, um, submitted to the summit from the Mormon community that was really great where they had learned about mental health and teaching each other a little bit about mental health experiences and how bullying connected to that. So I, I think um, you know this this can be a broad term, but we you know the more specific it gets for students is how they benefit, something we saw from the summit. Um, other recommendations also have to do with the community members and organizations where uh, they are engaged through community organizations outside of the school that may have to do with their faith or may not. And we saw some of those examples in actually a in one of our partners in Seek Kid to Kid where they're involved in the community and they're involved in their school by being an advocate for um, whatever issue it is, whether it has to do with their faith or a social justice issue. And connecting kids outside of their school seems to be a really important factor in helping people experience, students experience resilience and being sort of identifying and helping other students that might experience bullying. Uh, as a practitioner, you know, the recommendations that we came up with um, together here were about practitioners really understanding the experience of abuse that can come out of bullying and being akin to that, really, that bullying over long term uh, a long-term experience can be uh, parallel to the experience of abuse. And we've seen that, I think, through various um, uh, anecdotes, even through, uh, you know, just learning about that in, in the United States today, but also research, also psychological research showing that it is continued, uh, there's a continued mental health impact that can really rise to that level. So, and that the toxic effects of that can really um, be experienced by, this, by the student or the individual as an abusive experience. So, um, you know, the long-term mental health impacts we, that Nadia mentioned, of course, the depression and anxiety, but we have, there is, we have some connection to possible suicidal thinking. There isn't an exact understanding of the statistics on that, but that it can rise to that level has been researched and understood. So practitioners really have to, and part of our recommendations is to be aware of that, that when you're working with an individual in your office, a young person, or you're in schools working, that you really have to monitor that aspect because you don't know how often a young student might think about suicide that's experienced bullying. Um, and so, and, and oftentimes uh, when I, what I talk about when I'm speaking in a school is for uh, school psychologists or teachers to even ask students, um, how is the how is the bullying affected your mental health? How is it expect how has it affected you internally? That sometimes that question doesn't even get asked. There's a jump right away to conflict resolution. You know how do we fix this problem so that there's two parties are kind of calmed down? But what about the internal experience so that we can continue to monitor monitor that student? So these are some of the um, recommendations that were also in the report that we worked on, and and one that's not on here that. I did want to mention was for media organizations, social media 
plus media in general organizations that also have a tremendous impact on our youth, as we know. Uh, one of the recommendations in there was to understand positive representation a little bit better as they develop their applications, as they develop their um, tools for young people to use, uh, because there's a lot about sort of anti uh, hatred and sort of, you know, campaigns that are being um, implemented in social media or uh, companies that have to do with not, you know, combating the, 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 the stereotypes, but also they have to complement that a little bit with the representation that they're, they're uh, putting out there or actually, you know, utilizing to sell their products. So we talked about that in the, uh, in the recommendation section. I'm going to go on now to uh, a general the a general overview of mental health and bullying. I just want to close this up. So uh, Nadia has set the context a little bit here um, in terms of the white paper, and I had put in this piece here that um, really is important when we think about the general issue of bullying, which is that no single factor puts a child at risk. This is the idea about bullying, that no single factor puts a child at risk of being bullied or bullying others, that it can happen anywhere. And some of this is, uh, you know, the general understanding through the Department of Education and StopBullying.gov and something that we started to question a little bit in terms of um, how, how do we implement and, and start to take into account different faiths that feel that they have a risk factor, but it's not in the typical definition. Um, so, you know, to understand what is the, uh, the broad definition here is that you know, people who are at risk are perceived as different from their peers, which is typically being understood as being overweight or underweight, wearing glasses or different clothing, being new to school, or being unable to afford what other con kids consider cool. So we, we had decided with the summit we would broaden this by bringing in other factors of, of how people are perceived as different. Other things that are part of the general definition here is being perceived as weak or unable to defend themselves, depressed, have an experience of depression or anxious, have low self-esteem, less popular than others maybe don't get along with others, seen as annoying or provoking, and tagging as others for attention. And some of this, is, of course, is subjective. But however, even if a child has these risk factors, that doesn't mean that they will be bullied. So one of the things that I like to say when I talk about this broad definition is that um, you know, sometimes even your faith or whatever it is, your experience of difference it can be seen as a weakness already. So we have to kind of broaden our ideas of, of who gets targeted. Who becomes a bully? There are, two, there are two types of kids generally understood that are more likely to bully others. Some are considered connected, to, well connected, have social power. Um, others are isolated from their peers, may experience depression and anxiety themselves, and that's something to, to really think about when you are working in a school. You know, to really hone in what the, on the personal experience of the bully is, but the person who is, is doing the bullying or low self-esteem. Children who have these factors are also more likely to bully others. We have um, maybe there's less parental involvement. Um, and so some of these are, are the, the pieces to how to understand how you get to this place. Um, they view violence in a positive way, have, have, have friends who also bully others. So that's a, 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 an important facet of this, is that watching others as a young person is a really critical component to how you learn both to um, deal with a bully or how to um, deal with the climate where it's not regulated. You know, do you become a part of it or do you start to um, maybe try to change the climate? Uh, and some of the effects we talked about, you know, in terms of the mental health, I'm going to skip down to kids who are bullied here. They can experience those negative physical, social, and mental health issues, um, also health complaints decrease academic achievement, as we heard, and a uh, small number of bullied children might retaliate through violent measures. We, we've seen that through different um, experiences, but that there is sometimes this um, connection, and it's, it's, it's starting to become research, of course, with violence in, in, in terms of school shootings, but that you may find that 
um, in different incidents, there is this history of bullying that maybe was not addressed either to an individual or uh, to uh, uh, in a school climate that was not addressed. Um, bullying in groups, of course, is the importance of the, how students and uh, people who are bullied are observing and participating in the process. Um, and we talked about a little bit about the disconnection between adults and youth, but that issue of reporting is, has to do with the adults perhaps not knowing how to respond when this comes up. Um, and the notification, of course, is something that's lacking. Uh, and, you know, we talked about the mental health piece, but one thing that is important to know is that, you know, the mass the, mass majority, the vast majority of young people who are bullied do not become suicidal, but there are multiple risk factors and in, in someone who experiences suicide, who has died by suicide, but you can go back and find that there is some connection with uh, bullying and suicidal thinking, which is two different things, right? We have less statistics on the, the actual impact of, um, I'm sorry, the numbers on dying by suicide. So, um, Anyone involved with bullying, including those who bully others, are bullied and at risk for depression. So that's that piece of understanding that there's the bully, there's someone who's experiencing the bullying, but then there's everybody else that's around the uh, experience. They are the bystanders. Do they experience a mental health impact? They are finding that they do. So if you are watching this, if you're experiencing it just through your group of friends, but you yourself are not the, the person bullying or the victim, you will experience a um, long-term, you know, experience, uh, impact if it goes on for long-term, or it, you know, ultimately involves an entire community of students in in how they view their school and how they view the health of the school. So, you know, it's really important to understand that that it, you know, that it's not just two people here. You know, it's a lot of people that are involved. So um, I thank you all today for this uh, time, and I'm going to lead this on to Suzanne Greenfield. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Suzanne Greenfield, and I direct the District of Columbia's uh, Citywide Bullying Prevention Program. Um, I, it's actually a pleasure to, to do this particular talk because all of the research has been laid out for me. Um, I usually have to take the time to walk people through that and I don't have to um, because you just got a, an excellent um, understanding of, of what this problem is. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why it's so hard to solve because we actually do understand it, um, but, but changing these dynamics are really hard on the school level. Um, the work that I do, I actually look at it in, in two different ways. There are incidents that happen in schools where I have individual students who experience um, negative behaviors, and I will be honest with you, um, I was dubbed by the mayor the bully czar five years ago. I actually stay away from the word bully as much as possible, and I talk about behaviors as much as I can. Um, because I think we go into a mindset where when we talk about bullying, first of all, we're all triggered somewhat, and we're so worried that we don't actually use um, always our best ability to think through a problem and support kids. Um, and I think that's just our natural fears and anxieties around this issue. Um, so I look at this in, in when I'm working with schools. I need every kid to feel safe and supported, and I need to understand how a school is doing that. Um, Any time a kid comes and reports bullying or their parents do, we really do need to just focus on that individual student. Students are different. They have different levels of resiliency. They have different levels of, of coping mechanisms depending on their age. Everything, all those factors have a really tremendous impact on how well we'll be able to navigate the situation. So one of the things that I talk to schools a lot about is being really consistent and using a trauma-informed approach with any kid who has been targeted or feels targeted. Even if we find out, not so sure any technical bullying, if you use the definition, happened. But if a kid feels targeted, that's enough. And we really need to think about that in the individual sense of what's going on for that kid and what can we do to help that kid feel like they have some of their power back, that they are supported, that they have trusted adults. Um, I will say this to any parents in the room, key piece here is not to overreact 
um, I think, I, I can't remember if, if Nadia said it or Roxana, um, kids don't tell us when they're being targeted for two very good reasons. One, we do nothing. Two, we make it worse. They're not not telling us because they don't want us to know. They're not telling us because it doesn't help when they tell us. So it's a really important moment. Um, I, I like to teach a lot of breathing techniques. <laughs> if your kid starts telling you things, please don't overreact. Please listen. Please listen to the end um, because that's, that's when they shut down on us and that's when we have to get scared. Um, so we really think in terms of what can I do for my individual kid who's been targeted. I will tell you on the flip side, spend a lot of time thinking about the kid who is being aggressive in this situation because it's usually for a reason. It's not necessarily a good reason, um, but they're kids too, and I want them to feel safe and supported in a school. So we look at this issue when we're talking about an actual incident. You really need to understand what's happening on both sides of the equation and support both sides of the equation to change the behavior of the kid who's aggressive and to support the kid who has, has been targeted. We then like to step back with schools and say, is this a school where a lot of this is going on? Is it going on for a particular group of kids? Do we have kids who really don't feel seen and recognized? And that's when you start getting into whether it's religious minority, LGBTQ kids, um, kids who come from foreign countries and speak with accents or their parents do, kids with disabilities. We have a lot of kids who have historically experienced being targeted. So that's when we have to start working with schools. Step back, what's going on in the school What's the climate? It's a, it's a lot of the conversations we need to have around how do we make sure every kid in this school feels valued, feels connected, and feels like they have a place. It's an important thing for every kid to have a trusted adult in a school building, somebody they can go to um, if there's a problem. And we need to send those signals very intentionally and very specifically. And a lot of it has to do with what, what you know, Nadia talked about in the beginning. It's the social emotional learning. How are we teaching empathy? Empathy in the schools. This is elementary school, middle school, and high school. We should always be working on empathy skills. We should always be working on de-escalation skills. Um, I find we don't solve problems very well um, when we are escalating the problem. That doesn't mean it's not a serious problem, but the less we get escalated, the better chance we have of addressing it. So we spend a lot of time helping schools understand who in their, their community might be targeted and why and where, and think about how do we set up proactive ways to support those communities, to support those kids, and really set the tone in the school that that's not going to go. Um, I, I hear you on the, the upstander research. There's a lot being done on it. It's a little bit of a mixed bag. It's a lot to ask other kids um, to step into that place and be the upstander because then they might become the target. And we want to be really thoughtful. I would rather the adults do their job first. Um, and there's a lot we can do, particularly around modeling behavior, um, modeling how we want to see conflict resolved, modeling how we want to approach problem solving um, with kids. I will say this, what I see with in schools is they get, they get afraid really quickly. Um, and that's where the community support really comes into play. I have teachers who will say to me, I don't know what to say if a kid's been targeted because of their religious beliefs or because of you know, some other personal characteristic. They will, they will um, really appreciate the support <laughs> um, if they can work with you and your community groups to help demystify and better understand. Um, we've been doing this work for a long time, particularly with LGBTQ youth, and we have really changed a lot of the dynamics. Um, more in middle school and high school, I still have elementary schools who are terrified to talk about the, convert, the topic um, at hand, um, but I really hope that as I went to the summit, it was an amazing day, there were an, just, an enormous amount of information was there, but just incredibly good people um, who can help schools demystify. They don't know what to say. And if you can start partnering with them and building some trust uh, back and forth, what I see more than anything in the District of Columbia is we have a trust deficit. Um, we don't, our, our teachers don't trust our administrators. Our administrators don't trust the school system. Parents don't trust um, schools. And that really plays into 
a lot of the negativity that our kids are facing. Um, and so the community groups play an incredible role to somewhat to support, to help teachers think through, to demystify. Um, I, I, I had the pleasure both at, during the Obama years um, when um, Kid to Kid was presenting um, at, at one of the big bullying conferences and also last year to hear kids speak from their own mouths about what this means and who they are and how they feel changes teachers. It just does. Um, and to have that kind of community support, I can't tell you how important that is. And so it's exciting for me um, to see you guys here and to, to work with this research, because this is the road that we took um, for other targeted minority groups. And it's the work that we're trying to do with a lot of immigrant community spaces, um, because we're in a very strange time right now, um, where things that weren't acceptable um, are now acceptable. And we have to make them unacceptable again. Um, so I would urge anybody who has the opportunity um, to really think about ways that we can help educate people in schools about the community, about what's going on for Muslim kids, what's going on, how does it feel different um, for them, and, and just give them some basic knowledge, because they don't have it. Um, I can only speak for DC. Um, most of my, the educators I work with really don't have a very good understanding. Um, of what it's like to be a religious minority um, in the city. So I think it's something that, that I would look forward to, to partnering on. Um, in closing, I would just say I, we know a lot about this issue, but it's really hard um, to make big changes. Um, and so I think that, that a lot of this comes down to us um, spending the time talking to each other and figuring out what this looks like case by case. And as I said, I really think we have to treat the individual instances different than we look at the whole school model. Um, because I don't want kids who have been targeted to then feel it's their responsibility to teach everybody um, about themselves. I think that's a really unfair burden we sometimes put on kids. So I want to give them the opportunity to, to just get what their needs are met and, and bring it back to a, a much larger space when we're working out the problems. And that's more in the community. Thanks. My name is Vikram Mangat, and before I get into sh sharing my story, I wanted to share a quote with you all. Phil Kay once said, resilience is of course necessary for a warrior, but a lack of empathy isn't. I'm gonna repeat that. Resilience is of course necessary for a warrior, but a lack of empathy isn't. So until now, I thought I was a warrior for being resilient against my bullies growing up. But I had no empathy for them, so I was far from a warrior. So before I get into my story, I want to forgive and understand my bullies. I'm sorry I look different. I'm sorry I scared you. I'm sorry I made you feel unsafe. I know we were all just kids and that you didn't know how much you were hurting me. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a negative person nor am I looking for a pity party. I'm just looking to share my story, and if I inspire one person to change, then my work here is done. Anyways, my story with bullying starts at four years old. I had just started preschool, and I was excited, as any kid could be. But I didn't realize kids as young as four years old would start making fun of me for my long hair. They'd call me a girl. I was young and sensitive, my hair was long because of my sick identity at the time. I did not realize that the kids did not understand my faith. For the first time ever at four years old, my peers made me feel that me being myself was not enough for them. So I went ahead and I adapted. I did the logical thing. I cut my hair short. This was a temporary fix at the time. You know, three years later, the tables turned. I went from being bullied to being the bully. I was in second grade, and every day on the bus, I made fun of a group of kindergartners. I teased them for being shorter than me, not knowing in the future I'd be six foot four and the entire world would be shorter than me. <laughs> um, 
Anyways, I eventually got reported. I had a meeting with the kids, their parents, administration, and that scared me straight. I stopped being a bully for a while. About a year and a half later, you know, around third grade, I go to a sick summer youth camp, and I get very, very empowered by the Sikh religion, and I decide to grow my hair and wear a turban again. Little did I know I was making this choice in post 9-11 America. I didn't realize how hard it was going to be for a brown kid to wear a turban in post 9-11 America. I didn't expect kids to make fun of me. I didn't expect people to call me Taliban when I committed to wearing my hair long. I didn't expect my classmates to be genuinely scared of me for eight long years. The bullying in school was so bad that sometimes I didn't even want to go to school. I'd pretend to be sick. I would say my stomach hurt just to stay home. And the worst part is I couldn't tell anybody about it because I didn't want to be a snitch. I remember one time in middle school, a bully named Dylan, he tried to take my turban off in class. Rather than reporting him and reporting the ignorant, unacceptable action, I hit Dylan in the jaw. And this was all out of the desire to be tough and not to be a snitch. But that was just school. The crazy part was bullying was taking place in different areas of my life. I was even getting bullied from my friends in the Sikh community, which was amazing to me because, hey, these guys are wearing turbans in post 9-11 America. I thought they, of all people, would know how it feels like to be profiled or how it feels like to be targeted. So I was really surprised when they were bullying me, but they used to make fun of me for um, walking funny, being uncoordinated, having poor hand-eye coordination. And I didn't realize how much of an effect it had on me. At the time, I kind of just took it as a joke. But now, even walking into a room, I'm conscious about the way I walk. So it definitely did have long-term effects. That was throughout middle school. High school was a bit of an interesting time for me. I was pretty mellow until about 12th grade. That's when I turned into the biggest bully. I started hanging out with the wrong crowd, and I got extremely greedy. If someone had something I wanted, I would take it. I'd shoplift, I'd rob, I'd steal, and I was just a big bully. By the time college started, I stopped stealing as I was going to school in Baltimore, and I didn't want to upset anybody in the community. But I did get distracted. Even though I wasn't stealing, I did get distracted from just, I got distracted from school. So basically what I decided to do is I took some time off of the university route and I went to community college. And I just couldn't get my grades together and I kept getting in trouble. My self-esteem wasn't too good. I kept getting in trouble with the law. In 2016, two times in 60 days, I got arrested for minor marijuana charges. And my parents and I thought the best thing for me to do would be to move to California. So I moved to California. I moved to San Jose. I attended San Jose State University. I had a great semester. I was involved with Toastmasters. I was um, involved with Innovation Club. We threw the uh, mic uh, hackathon that was sponsored by Microsoft. I did really well. But little did I know, that summer, everything would change. June of 2016, everything changed for me. I was doing a lot of Raja Yoga at the time, and I felt like I was going through a spiritual awakening. This led me to pick up garbage all around the city of San Jose. After a few days of meditating and just feeling absolutely freaking unstoppable, I took a few pieces of trash. I picked up like a McDonald's bag and a cup, and I did some minor vandalism, and I put it on top of a police officer's car. I walked away, nothing happened to me. Later that night, around 11 p.m., I was walking into 7-Eleven um, to get a drink, a Gatorade, after a day full of cleaning and meditating. And as I was approaching the door, a group of cops grab me, and they assault me. And they throw me to the ground, they break my nose, they take me to the jail for the night. It was a pretty traumatizing experience, but I was in a blissful experience, um, state of mind, so I left jail just to get locked up again the next night for the same reason of being sick. 
I en ended up finding out that I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I was hospitalized for 21 days. I was assaulted by the police. At the time, I should have been taken to the hospital, but I was taken to a jail cell. I'm not saying all this stuff to you know, make you guys feel bad for, you, for me, but I want you to understand that bullying does have a long-term effect. I know I'm tight on time, so I'm gonna kind of ditch the rest of my speech, but I want you to understand that these past 18 months since I've been diagnosed with bipolar, past two years, I was in denial for 18 months. I, even at the summit, the bullying summit which I attended, I was in a state of denial at that time for my diagnosis. And it got so bad to the point where I wasn't taking my medication and I was hospitalized. I was in and out of the hospital a bunch of times. One time, you know, the, the most recent hospitalization was June of 2018. This year, six months ago, I got into a big fight with my little sister and um, she, I said some hurtful things, she said some hurtful things, and it lingered with me for about a week, everything she said. They, it went along the lines of, you're 24 and you're still at home, what's going on with you? And I just saw that she didn't see me how I thought she saw me. So what did I do? I decided to take action. I, after a week of this sitting on my head, I went and looked for my old prescriptions from previous hospital medic, um, visits, and I found Ativan. It's a benzo, similar to Xanax. I took not one, not two, not five, but I took 10 Ativans in the attempt to take my own life. This was a hard time for me, but I survived. And the fact that I survived life has never been the same since. I tried to take my own life, and I'm still here. And the fact that I'm still here shows there's a reason for it. And I'm not saying this for some mumbo jumbo motivation or to just have a sob story. I want you guys to understand if, you're, if you or someone you know is getting bullied, you can get through it. I have tangible results. Six months ago, I wanted to kill myself. Now I have my own business. I have my own line of meal replacements, my own supplements, an app on the App Store and the Google Play Store and I'm six months away from graduating. If I can do it, you can do it, but it takes a little bit more re than resilience. It takes some empathy. Thank you for your time. I think um, it's hard for me to talk to you after that story. Um, Dr. Harmander, who is Vikram's mom, was gonna speak next, but I think she needs a moment um, to just take that all in. Thank you, Vikram, for sharing that. Sorry. <laughs> I think um, if we could, um, should we do question and answers or? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, and maybe we can, we can give you a chance to say some of what you were gonna say in the Q&A. Would that make sense? Okay, so why don't we have all the panelists come up and we'll um, start the Q&A and let Dr. Harmander share some of what she knows through the question and answer. Um, we're gonna open it up for questions. There are, uh, there's one person, Holly, with the mic back there. So um, if anyone has a question in the audience, please feel free to just raise your hand and she will give you the mic. And um, for those of you on the live stream, if you would like to answer a question, uh, if you would like to ask a question, um, you tweet us at the hashtag DC Dialogues. Is that right? So you can tweet us your question at hashtag DC Dialogues, and someone will be fielding the questions uh, via Twitter. So feel free to join in the conversation. Thank you. Um, I'll maybe throw out, oh, sure. Question over here. It's okay, no, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Shark uh, Zafra, I'm with Facebook, and uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me, this is a terrific event, I really appreciate uh, your sharing your story, I can't imagine what it's like. Um, is religious-based bullying, um, to, to the PhDs here, is it qualitatively different than other types of bullying um, that, you know, that people may face based on national origin or just other? And then also, um, 
we're really interested in looking for ways that we can positively uh, address this issue, be a force for good, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or other apps that we have. Are there some actions that you've seen that private companies have taken that have been best practices that you think others should replicate? Um, so in terms of your first question, is religious-based bullying different than other forms of bullying? I think it's no different than other forms of bias-based bullying. Um, so if there are characteristics that are essential features of somebody's identity, whether it's um, you know national ancestry or um, sexual preference or anything like that, I think that if there are central features of your identity, then it probably impacts in much the same way. In terms of your uh, second question, would you mind repeating that in terms so, of? So I'm, I'm at Facebook, I'm on Facebook, and um, I'm, I work with my colleagues at Instagram, which we own, uh, and we're looking for ways that we can be a force of good. Force of good. This, is a, this is an issue that you know we, we pay a lot of attention to. Um, and I was interested to see if there's other examples in the private sector where companies have made uh, good steps that you think others should replicate you know, in terms of best practices. Uh, yeah, so I actually attended um, the social media, um, well, it was a social media and dealing with suicide summit um, in general in Silicon Valley last year. Uh, and it was headed by After School, one of the apps that is a, you know, a, an app that is, uh, has to do with anonymity, really use it as an anonymous user as opposed to the other applications that kids use these days, uh, the social media applications. So uh, they have now, a lot of the Silicon Media, I'm sorry, Silicon Valley media organizations have partnered with NIH to understand this issue of technology, mental health, and suicide that gets kind of um, wrapped into that as they've seen through statistics through the CDC. And what I know is that they are working on um, finding ways to combat or understand better, you know, statements that are made that have to do with suicide or mental health issues and outsource that in some way to people who can deal with that. So I know that they are trying to identify statements that get made online better so that they can help that individual. And I, I think that is useful. I, and there's great examples, like Crisis Text Line that I've learned about um, you know, nationally. But I would say when it comes to religious-based bullying, something I did give input into at that summit was that there is really not enough of an understanding of how people um, are, are getting targeted online, that there is something about you know, understanding stereotypes that get perpetuated and how that can relate to a larger issue like violence or terrorism. And a lot of the work gets centered around that. But at the same time, there's not, there are not risk factors for what types of users and understanding the risk factors have to do with ethnic differences, religious differences. And, and they're not able to mark that. They're not able to understand you know, uh, an exact, they don't have exact measures yet on, on who the users are based on that because it's not been understood as part of the bullying definition. So what, you know, I, I, I think that's an important element in understanding you know, what kinds of comments are being made that have to do with, you know, uh, calling people out based on difference and uh, something they are trying to understand as it does not relate to something like an like a issue like terrorism, for instance, you know, not tracking violent or hateful uh, ideology, but rather how does it relate to this, the users and understanding prejudice and, and, and bullying online and being able to track it when it comes to differences. So, but I do know they are working considerably with NIH to understand those pieces that um, will help get people help. And that is a first step. Um, so I, that's what I have learned. I wanted to add to, uh, so the community organization that a couple of people talked about was Sick Kid to Kid. And we have been involved in the Youth Activation Summit at Facebook at Menlo Park. And um, my feeling is there's, you know, bad news always gets sens uh, so much sensation. It, it, it's like everywhere. And we never hear that uh, kids who are doing good on Instagram or on Facebook, they actually get uh, rewarded by, I mean, somehow it's the, it's the hits that count, but the comments mean nothing on the social media. 
So I don't know what your intelligent ways can work on that, that um, good comments can actually come to the top uh, rather than getting hits, because uh, generally a good comment gets suppressed. It never gets um, sensationalized like a bad news. And so in our uh, organization right now, we're going to be doing a full day of teaching um, the entire staff of Churchill High School on January 17th. And we are happy to Facebook Live. But like the fact is that those kind of things should, be, should gain popularity so more kids feel empowered to do that. So uh, just as a, uh, an example of community involvement of the kids so that they feel good about themselves. Also, just to add, um, we don't have enough research yet to understand what the, um, the psychology, the cyber psychology, in terms of the disinhibition effect, um, in terms of um, cyber communities. Um, they don't function like regular face-to-face -face communities. And so as a researcher, of course, I'm going to be biased and say that we don't have a lot of information yet. And you know, as Roxana said, that you know, that obviously um, government organizations are um, trying to lead that. Um, but I think that there more needs to be done in terms of research informing application in terms of what Facebook, Instagram, and uh, other social media outlets can do. Um, so Obviously, we have to learn more about it um, to inform those recommendations. Hi, thank you all for uh, your presentations today. My name is Zainab, and I'm with the Council on American Islamic Relations. I had a question for Susan relating to the role of curriculum in this, and how does incomplete or inaccurate curriculum and lack of teacher uh, sensitivity play a role in exacerbating the problem of school climate and that trust that you were talking about. Um, and and I'll, I'll let you jump in if you have some research on this. We are part of a National Institutes of Justice study right now, and we're doing school climate research in about 30 of our um, middle and high schools in the district right now. And my favorite question um, that I like to look at is, how do you see yourself reflected in the curriculum? Um, and I think this is just a fascinating understanding of that that can show very quickly why kids don't do or don't feel safe when you've never s when you're never seen <laughs> in your school. It's really hard to feel a part of the community. Um, so what we are seeing is that that is not only true for religious minority students. That is true for our immigrant kids. It's certainly true for our LGBTQ kids, and it's true for our kids with disabilities, which, by the way, are all categories that seem to show up a lot in the bullying world. <laughs> so I, I, it's hard for me not to think there's a connection. Um, we will have that research. We're in the third of a four-year four study, um, but I think it's key, and I think it's you know it's something we have to you know, constantly talk to schools about. How are you making sure everybody in your community is being seen and valued in an appropriate way? Um, I also really worry about schools putting spotlights on kids inappropriately. Um, so we have to do it in a, in a thoughtful way, but you know, not everybody's looking to the right places for curriculum building. I can promise you that. <laughs> I'd also like to share from my own research uh, with Muslim youth, a lot of times, um, children in the focus groups said things like, um, as a Muslim, um, I felt like I had to say something or quote unquote out myself um, when Islam was taught in the curriculum because it was taught inaccurately. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't necessarily prepared for people to know that aspect of their identity. And that is something that is truly an individual's decision to share or not to share but they felt that they were compelled to do it, um, to be a representative, um, to um, make sure that they were correcting misinformation. And as Suzanne is saying, you know, this is quite a responsibility for a young child. Um, the other thing is, is that they were saying that Islam was portrayed as uh, not as a modern or current religion. Um, so uh, some children said that, you know, um, Children go to the well to um, get water, to do wudu um, in, in preparation for prayer. Things like that that made the religion seem antiquated and, um, and not current and not something that could potentially be American. 
Um, and so the findings from my research were very telling. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. There's a lot of qualitative evidence in terms of interviews and um, you know other research. But there's not a lot of quantitative data about this. But we know it's an issue. There are resources out there. Um, ING, Islamic Networks Groups, has a lot of information about teacher uh, training and uh, you know curriculum development. Um, there, are, there are lots of, as Soup Kitchen Kids, you have quite mm -hmm. a few um, you know, great resources for teachers. Um, so there are ways that schools can, um, can present accurate information. It just has to be sought out. And I wanted to add to that that the information in the U.S. history books, I know about Sikhism, I'm sure about Islam and Hinduism and Judaism, especially because I, I am a, uh, part of the faith community working group and I chair the, the education committee in Montgomery County. And there's a lot of inaccuracy. You know, kids have been attending school for I don't know how long, and they've been reading that uh, Sikhism started in 1984, and that it, uh, it, it's not, I'm exaggerating, but they only quote uh, the incidents of uh, annexation of uh, the, um, the Golden Temple and that Sikhs believe in militancy. And so, uh, and then the questions are totally wrong. College, uh, what is the, college board has wrong questions. So if a sick kid mm, answers it wrong, they obviously don't get their full marks. And uh, I mean, those are, don't need to research that. Those are true things, you know. And, and incidentally, we happened to present Sikhism 101 and talked about all this in front of the professor who actually writes the curriculum. So hopefully it changes. I just wanted to make a note too on the issue of responsibility for the student to correct you know, the, mis the misconceptions in this age group. And when you think about adolescent identity development, you know, from this age of nine to 10, nine, 10, up through you know, late adolescence, you know, when the, these stages really are about negotiating oneself and the world, you know, they're thinking about who, who are they? That's the fundamental conflict of adolescence and it applies to adolescents from every background mm -hmm. because we understand this as, as the process of development. So who are they, I mean, has to do with that cultural experience, has to do with their religious background. So if they are, or whatever faith has been informed in their environment, if that is part of it. So if they are still negotiating that in terms of you know, will I take this with me? What can I show to the world? You know, do I believe in these concepts? I mean, there are young, you know, that age is essentially doing that every day because they, they have to kind of master this as their ego <laughs> experience, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and it's a hard task, you know? So when you ask anyone, right, from those, those different categories to, so, you know, so-called categories to try to explain it, and, and, and actually stand up to understanding it when they may themselves still be developing those notions in their own household. Maybe there's a cross-cultural experience going on, you know, from home to school, from parent generation to generation. You know, it's, it's overwhelming and it can result in further isolation. It can result in, si in really someone going silent because that uncertainty is inherent in where they are. So I think that's why it's so important to think of, I like the question about curriculum and teacher training because um, you know, it, it does take a little bit less of the onus off of them from being explaining something that's really not where they are yet. You know? So I just think that's an important aspect. Thank you so much for that. My name is Dahlia Mulgahed and I direct research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Um, I just wanted to offer uh, one, one thing that I've seen work in um, a private school that I was working with. They actually had a parent advisor uh, for the Muslim students at that school. And so when something came up where there was a, a book that the whole school was assigned that had very Islamophobic depictions of the community in it, there was an adult advocate that could step in and, and have adult conversations with administrators rather than just the students having to fend for themselves. So I think that idea of, 
we're actually bringing in adults as advisors to the administration for these different groups that might be targeted by bullying gives students some support at the adult level um, that where they aren't the ones outing themselves or, or whatever and having to, to take on very adult, you know, and then the power structure, the power differential of the student-teacher relationship, it's too heavy a burden without an adult advocate. So I think that model I, th I saw really work well. I had a question for Vikram. Um, thank you so much for the courage you had to share that story. I, I was really wondering about the difference in how you experienced, if you're comfortable sharing, bullying from within your own community versus bullying from outside your community by people who didn't understand your, you know, your, your identity. How did that, what was the difference between those two things? So at, within the faith, like at the, we call it the Gurdwara, like what your community would call the mosque. Um, at the Gurdwara, it was, the bullying, it seemed like it was more of like a joking thing, where at school, there was moments like, people were genuinely scared of me. They're like, they thought I was gonna blow the cafeteria up. So it was a different type. Like, I guess at the Gurdara, it was a lot more lighthearted, but it still did get to me. I just didn't, I didn't realize it was getting to me. Did that answer your question? And, and we see it uh, in having this group as sick kid to kids. So uh, we uh, we are we belong to a congregation, and we have kids that um, have their full identity, and the other kids who cut their hair and all. And we hear from all other kids also that from within the community there is an eliteness type of a factor. You know, some kids who keep their full identity think they are really elite. They really know it. They don't need any questions and answers. They don't need to be asked. Like, uh, and so there is a isolation aspect at the community as well. At I mean, at school we don't have any doubts, but even at the community, maybe it's the same kid that faces both those things because there's always um, how that kid feels and how sensitive the person is. But we've noticed that, and and that's the first thing. In fact, I wanted to answer uh, the other question you had and the and the comment you had, that um, we believe the other way. Sikh Kid Tukit believes that uh, we want to empower the students. So we had this meeting with the principal at Churchill High School, and I happened to ask her that can some of the adults come for January 17th when we are teaching Sikhism. She says, you're welcome to come, but the teachers have a very good impact if they hear directly from their students. So I would say that um, the adults should only work as coaches and advocates, but get your students uh, talking to the teachers. Talk, get your students talking to the administrators. Because last year, my daughter, Hannah, uh, who's the founder of Sick Kid to Kid, worked at Churchill, and um, the lot of changes that were made in the school uh, for the better, you know. And so I would empower the students, and I would push the students as much as possible. And they like it. If you're with them, they like it. I think it's also important to say that while that may work in, in uh, your high school or you know, a parent model might work in another high school or some combination of the two. Um, I think that um, with any kind of prevention or intervention programming, it's, it's never a one size fits all. We can provide recommendations and then schools need to tailor it to fit their community of students and families. Um, and so it could be some combination of both depending on what the needs are. I think someone had, a, did you still have a question over here? I know you raised your hand a couple of times. No, okay. <laughs> someone in the back over there. Oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, hey there. Um, Thank you for the fantastic talk. My name is Arthur Fadim. I'm faculty in the Department of Mental Health at Johns Hopkins University. Um, so there's this idea, this question of religious identity um, that comes at the individual level that kids are kind of forced to identify in schools. Um, seems to be a theme that um, no matter what religion you are, um, needs to be identified once you leave the school because it's something the themes that come across happen to come with families and your religious institutions. 
Um, so where does this idea of religious institutions kind of taking some of these principles that tend to be olden and kind of bringing it up to date to kind of inform these kids or the families and kind of um, passing on messages or themes or morals um, that could influence not only the current generation but in kind of informing principles as kids age. Um, and the second question comes from the identity of um, re religious identity as strength and from Vikram's moving story where he kept on going back to Sikhism and finding strength at different time points in, in, uh, throughout his life. Um, does religious bullying kind of take you away from that? The fact that the moral principles from either being um, identifying with the religion, the c cultural values that come with it, does religious bullying kind of take you away from it? And what, where does the community and the school kind of help inform kids to kind of re-identify or kind of get strength back from whatever religion that they pursue? Can I say something slight? So if I could um, comment in my own uh, research, I found that um, a strong, a strong religiosity was a protective factor against various forms of bullying, which somewhat shocked me because I thought if kids are um, very strong in their religiosity, then they're likely demonstrating that in their day-to-day -day behaviors at school, which may identify them more concretely as Muslim. And I only looked at Muslim youth. So I was both surprised and not surprised at the same time that religiosity was a protective factor. Um, but then it was, um, so the thing is, is that religious coping has been found to be a protective factor against a lot of mental health, uh, negative mental health outcomes. So it's not altogether surprising. Um, so it's, it's very interesting and still, these are preliminary data um, and I haven't published them yet. Um, but I think that it's, it's important because this is a grounding force um, for um, these uh, young kids who, um, you know, otherwise, you know, um, may succumb to the issues related to bullying. Um, so going back to your other question about whether bully, religious-based bu bullying either driving someone closer to religion or driving them away, I think it can go in either direction. I think that, um, so for example, um, as an Arab American Muslim woman, after 9-11, prior to 9-11, my ethnic identity and my religious identity were important, but they weren't salient factors in who I am. After 9-11, when I felt that there was maybe some, um, some criticism, it actually made me feel more solid in who I am because I actually felt an attack on my group. And so I think that it depends on the individual and their way of perceiving that identity. It can either go in one direction or another. Or in Vikram's case, in one phase of your life, it pushed the religious-based bullying pushed you away from your faith. And in other times, you sought it back out. And so I think it really depends on the individual and the different part of time in their life. I, I mean, I would just add that, that I think, you know, th it is a kind of mix. And of course, individual dynamics have a lot to, to do with it and, and, and what other resilient factors people have. You know, in Hannah's case, who helped us organize this summit, I think, you know, having individuals in her life that could be, um, and, and of course Vikram at different times, you know, that are those, are those protectors, you know, lift someone up. And, but part of the reason we established the summit to, and convened it was because we didn't want to underestimate the importance of environmental messages of, uh, in identity development, you know, for adolescents. So I think, you know, it, it is on balance, but um, when it comes from a different directions and you're in it, whether it's in a school, a community, media, different places, does that impact and the identity development of an individual, we know it does. Research has shown that it does. So the psychological research. So you know that's why there are so many great, there's great programming happening now around this. So I, I just don't ever want to underestimate mm -hmm. the individual who might be experiencing it, who doesn't have those other um, protectors. And, and even in Vik Vikram's case, I think he demonstrates incredible courage and resilience. And there will be, a, there will, like we've seen, there's a back and forth process even then. So um, 
and and I think cultural messaging is a uh, a part of you know how how we become who we are right as 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 adults. So I, I think that's an important piece. So really quickly, I just wanted to chime in. Um, I'm not sure what the research or the evidence says, but my short answer to your question, religious-based bullying got me away from my religion. That, that's the truth. Yeah. So I just bring this picture up here that I'm a Sikh and I have my own identity. So I just want to give you a background of uh, what Sikhs believe in. Uh, they believe in justice for all, equality for all, and doing selfless service. So if there is a kid who's been called names, physical removal of turban, there's institutional ag ignorance on the part of the educators. I had another slide where a kid was asked to uh, take the role of the villain just because the kid had a turban and a beard. They were going to a, a, a party, and this is one of the teachers who said that. So when it comes to defending themselves, there's going to be, do I fight back the right way, or do I stand my ground, you know, the, versus avoiding conflict? What do I do? And then um, this kid goes to the community where they are being told that you've got to be strong, you've got to stand your ground, you've got to, you're a Sikh, you fight for justice, and they go home and they say, no, let's avoid, con uh, actually you go to school and they're told you, you walk away from the scene. You go tell your uh, teachers or you tell an adult something, and then at home also getting mixed messages, no, you must stand your ground and avoid conflict. So, I mean, it's a no, like, you know, I know my husband says no brainer and I don't like that, but uh, uh, being a parent, I feel that this case is only going to have a lot of effect. You know, whether we like to put it in writing somewhere or not, but this kid is going to have a lot of effect from all that conflict in their mind, uh, because the, there are two sides of the story all the time. But adding to that, I want to say which the topic that um, was mine and I couldn't speak after Vikram spoke was that no matter what we do, bullying hurts and I'm going to go through these slides really quickly and come to this relevant slide that bullying can be from peers and bullying can be from teachers and the administration. And the most important thing is to, to report it. You know, and um, recently uh, we have been involved with the, with the school district. The school district, obviously, the schools um, advise the, peop uh, the parents, the students, and who can report it. It can be a um, student, it can be the parent, it can be a close adult or a staff member of the school. There is a form that needs to be filled out. And um, because of uh, privacy issues, most of the parents and the party on the side of the victim are interested in knowing what happened to the bully. But for the privacy of the bully, sometimes the school has to send them to the crisis center, but they'll never let us know. Our interest should never be what happened to the bully. Our interest should be what happened to my kid, because my kid wants me to hold his hand and to know that I really care, I really care, and I'm going to be with you no matter what. You know, so as a parent, uh, that's all I wanted to say, and to, you know, to be the best cheerleader you can be for your child, and to sort of always teach them to, uh, uh, you know, stand up and stand by people, and um, to help your child to always be a superstar, to get them involved in the communities and to get them involved in whatever they are best at. And so that's why I mentioned that even if they're best at social media, they can start campaigns which are like positive, you know. So because we, we do hear these days, and unfortunately going to these colleges, the youngsters are uh, having dinner conversations at home which are only talking about hate. And then on social media, there's only hate. And so really, uh, we want to see more positive stuff in order to change this um, climate. Thank you. Thank you. Can, that's good. Um, 
Unfortunately, we've come uh, to the end of our time together. I feel like we could go on for another hour. There's so much more to talk about. Um, I want to ask uh, or, or mention a couple of things as we close. First, I want to thank all of the panelists. This was a great discussion, and I still have a million questions. Um, and thankfully, we are having, uh, for the next half hour, some snacks and drinks outside. Um, so for those of you who are in the room, I hope you can join us for the next half an hour and that the panelists can stay and, and continue this discussion with those who are here. For those of you on the live stream, I apologize that we can't virtually share uh, with you. Um, I want to encourage you to go to www.ispu.org uh, where you can find the report that everyone was mentioning and our educators toolkit, which is a collection of resources that educators can use um, in their schools, uh, not just to address bullying, but to create more safe and inclusive classrooms. Um, I really want to thank the Bradamus Center at NYU for this wonderful space, um, and AMP, and uh, our partners on the Interfaith Summit, Sikitikid and ING. Um, and before we go, I want to ask you all to uh, help us. We always hope that these um, panels and discussions are useful to you. And so I know that you all have cell phones. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't. So if you could pull out your cell phone, and hopefully we've got signal in here. Um, and I want to just ask you three quick questions. But before we do that, if you could send a text to the number 22333, and in the body of the text, just put MJ16, MJ16. I'll give you a second to do that. So once you've sent that text to the number 22333, uh, we have three questions for you, which I'd like you to answer. The first is, um, do you think the research presented today was of high quality? If you think the research uh, was of very high quality, then please text the number 5. If you thought the research was not of good quality, then text the number 1. Um, and then there are, of course, options in between. I'll give you a moment to do that. This is a test of your texting skills. I hope you all pass. <laughs> OK. The second question is, the research presented is relevant. Did you think that what we presented to you here today was relevant to you? Uh, either in your professional or in your personal life. Again, if you strongly agree that it's relevant, that would be a number five. If you don't think it was relevant, it's a number one. And then there are, of course, options in the middle. OK, and the last and third question, before you can go and get some cheese and crackers, <laughs> is um, I plan to apply the recommendations presented in my life and my work. Was something that you learned today, whether one thing or 10 things, will you apply that in your life or in your, either in your professional or personal life? Again, if you agree, and you will, then it's a number five. If you don't think it was useful, then it's a number one, and then everything in between. And once you're done with that, you're free to go. And I want to thank you all so much. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.